Right, good morning everyone. My name is Jane Goodman Delahunty, and today I'm going to be talking about some research, a program of research that I've been conducting uh, with some colleagues in New South Wales, uh, Sydney, Australia, where I work, um, on the topic of interpreting. And we're looking at interpreting in legal settings. So I'll be covering mostly what happens in police interviews or interrogations, but I'll also talk a little bit about some interpreting findings from court experiments. And our research has mainly been experimental in nature, so the title is Experimental Insights uh, for Best Practice. I wanted to start by giving a little consideration to why I think uh, there are questions about a research on interpreting uh, that are important. Uh, the first uh, thing that I think is useful to have is an overview of linguistic prevalence across the globe. So the most prevalent languages are English, then Mandarin, then Arabic, then Cantonese, then Vietnamese, and then Spanish. Uh, there are about two others that sort of fall into uh, the top eight. Uh, uh, the others that I haven't listed there are um, from India. The languages from uh, India, like Urdu uh, and um, and uh, Hindi, I think. Uh, in Australia, where I live, um, we find that about one fifth of the population speak a language other than English at home, and about um, three percent are entirely non-English speaking. Um, so this does have some implications uh, for the justice sector. And in particular, uh, as things have changed recently, where there's much more mobility across transnational borders and within borders, uh, this can uh, increase the demand for interpreting so that national security concerns are met, so that justice is enhanced. Uh, and particularly what I'm concerned about is avoiding miscarriages of justice through errors uh, in the use of interpreting. As things have speeded up with uh, technological innovations these days, we find that more and more people are tending to use remote interpreting services rather than in-person interpreting services. So uh, in the interest of distance, time, and efficiency, uh, we see that legal practice itself is globalizing, so our police practices and interpreters are taken along with those groups. The importance of interpreting is also to look at some fundamental legal rights or human rights. Uh, the notion that you have the right, for example, to confront your accuser um, if you're a defendant or the right to be heard if you are a victim uh, is dramatically impacted by the availability of uh, sound, efficient, effective interpreting services uh, if you're a defendant or a victim who is not fluent in the mainstream justice language. Uh, that can impact the quality of the evidence that is adduced through questioning by, for example, police practitioners or by lawyers in court. And surprisingly, uh, just as accented language in whatever the main language is can impact credibility, so we know that learning about facts of a case or evidence that is mediated by an interpreter also impacts the credibility of the speaker. And I'll be showing you some findings uh, on that topic. There's, there's a great deal of work that needs to be learned by the justice sector to provide good advice on how to select interpreters uh, and to tell whether you're getting good interpreting performance. So what's at stake here, as I've indicated, are miscarriages of justice or risks to justice. Um, but in fact, uh, when we started looking into this topic, we found that there was very little known about ways to manage the risks or what the limitations are of certain practices to guide policy formulation or to guide best practice. In fact, there can be um, a lot of conflict between interpreting standards from one jurisdiction to another. 
and there is no universal or transnational legal standard for interpreting at this point. This is illustrated by um, a case that came up in the Australian legal system. It involved five Japanese nationals who were arrested on Australian territory for heroin in importation. And all of the interviews were conducted by police using the same interpreter for all five defendants. And that interpreter used what we call the simultaneous mode of interpreting. In other words, while the defendants were speaking, instantaneously the interpreter speaks at the same time. Um, and at the end of that case, all five defendants were convicted of heroin interpret, uh, importation, um, and they appealed on grounds that the interpreting was very inadequate. The prosecution looked over the transcript of what the interpreter uh, had said and said that while there were some errors, they were merely minor grammatical errors. The defendants still had their right to give their version of what happened and that their right to defend themselves in the legal proceeding had not been uh, undermined. The transcripts showed, um, if you analyze them carefully, that in fact at many instances, the simultaneous interpreting was not uh, verbatim in the sense that it wasn't continuous. It was what we call summary interpreting. So there were many gaps, many omissions, and then the interpreter had uh, used her own uh, language skills to try to synthesize large chunks of speech on the behalf of the defendants. And that meant that there was information that was omitted. Um, sometimes the interpreter asked her own questions of the witnesses, and there were errors in uh, just the translation or the interpretation along the way. So the case made its way up to the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, and they looked at this because it was a transnational case uh, involving Japan and Australia. And when they looked at the transcripts, they said that they thought that the level of the interpreting was sufficiently poor that it had undermined the credibility of those five defendants and uh, they tried to promulgate a standard then saying that it is necessary that an interpreter is fully competent for the task. So part of what we need to examine is what does full competence really mean? How do you assess it? How do you unpack it? Ultimately those five convictions were overturned uh, on the grounds of that interpreting. I want to give you another example for another place in the world this time, the United Kingdom. A few years ago, there was literally what we called an interpreting crisis in Great Britain. <laughs> uh, and this was because the Ministry of Justice had issued directives that interpreters be hired, and they were very cost conscious. And so they took bids from different interpreting agencies, and they selected the lowest bids. So they were interested in just keeping the cost down. Um, and what the, what the Justice Select Committee said was that this particular committee had no insight into the complexity of what is involved in doing good legal interpreting. And they didn't bother looking at qualifications, they didn't even bother looking at criminal record checks of the groups who were bidding on these jobs. Um, and one company called Applied Language Solutions you know, uh, was doing nearly all of the interpreting across England and Wales, so they had a monopoly of it. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, the Justice Select Committee was very critical of the privatization of the interpreting uh, in legal settings. And they found that many trials ultimately collapsed because of the poor quality of the interpreting. Many suspects were kept in custody unnecessarily because of it, and as many as 2,600 trials had to be redone. Uh, so this, this was a crisis for the legal system uh, because of poor policy making without sufficient criteria. So I use this example just to highlight 
really a contemporary issue that uh, devolved into um, a considerable justice difficulty. So this leads me to summarize a few of what I've called contextual research challenges uh, that underpin this field of research endeavor. The first problem that we encounter is that many people, including, we learned, many police officers uh, who work with interpreters, have fundamental misconceptions about what is involved in interpreting. In other words, they think that what an interpreter does is render a word-for-word -word verbatim translation, like a computer. <laughs> um, but in fact, uh, that misunderstands languages uh, because there are not those kinds of language equivalents. Uh, many times there is not a lexical uh, component that is an exact match from one language pair to another. And of course, it depends on the languages that you're talking about. Some languages are closer on the family tree than others. Others are entirely different in terms of their orthography or their writing, the grammar structure, etc., etc. So so the distances can bridge uh, quite broadly. Whereas what interpreters are trying to do and the goal of their task is to render what we call pragmatic equivalence, not verbatim equivalence, because verbatim equivalence may not make sense. If words have different meanings in different languages, then you don't want uh, that precise match. But many legal professionals have no insight into this at all. So when they find that an interpreter is using more words than the speaker used, they become suspicious right away because they don't understand that that might be necessary to achieve pragmatic equivalence. The other thing that is problematic is that people often assume that anyone who has any bilingual capacity is therefore qualified to be an interpreter. They have very little insight into what actually the task of interpreting involves uh, and don't understand that people can have different levels of bilingualism depending on which language they learn first or when they learn their second language. Uh, so your competence in, in a second, third, fourth or fifth language might be very uh, different uh, depending on individual skills and, and your own uh, capacity. So, so just because you're bilingual doesn't mean that you are uh, ready to go into any legal setting as a qualified, competent, proficient interpreter. But many times, uh, you know, especially in, in areas of crisis, and you see this a lot, for example, uh, with some of uh, the United States uh, interviews of individuals who are what we call high value or terrorist detainees. They will pick up somebody from the community in that area who they think is bilingual or who claims to be bilingual and they will assume that that person can provide perfectly competent interpreting services. So that's a big research question to see really uh, what that gap is. Um, there is also a difference between having bilingual competence and cultural competence because part of what interpreters do when they're achieving pragmatic equivalence is to try to make an assessment about the cultural differences uh, within which the language that is being used resonates. Uh, and not everyone who is bilingual is fully conversant with all of the cultural issues that surround a particular speaker or a particular use of a dialect. For example, you know, I learned French at high school back in Johannesburg where no one even spoke French, so I had a very textbook academic French. I certainly, you know, uh, wouldn't describe myself as really linguistically or culturally competent to make translations or interpreting, for example, uh, you know, with French English issues in Mauritius, Madagascar with different cultures, uh, or even, or even, you know, French Canadian uh, versus of uh, French-speaking individuals from France. They're all culturally different. And you need to be familiar with the culture that is the target culture of the speaker in order to really do a good job of pragmatic equivalence. So oftentimes, uh, that issue is entirely ignored. <laughs> 
then there are a whole lot of default practice modes that seem not ever to have been evidence-based, but are simply circumstantial uh, for odd reasons, one or another. And so I've, I call this really reliance on habituation rather than evidence-based practice. And a key one which uh, emerges is whether the interpreting is done in the simultaneous mode that I described earlier, or whether it's done in what we call the consecutive mode. In the consecutive mode, uh, the speaker utters a sentence or two, uh, and the interpreter waits until there's an appropriate gap in the speech, usually making notes uh, on a piece of paper at the time, uh, and then uh, may intercede, you know, and uh, then do the interpreting, and then uh, the speaker picks up again, uh, or the questioner, if it's an interview, uh, you know, across languages, there'll be a pause for the consecutive interpreting. So, so is one mode better than the other is a huge question. And are people, uh, most interpreters, um, tend to practice, it turns out, in more in one mode or another, depending on uh, the need for the interpreting. And, and in looking at some of the history of how uh, mode choice developed, it became clear to me that it was quite arbitrary. <laughs> um, so for example, in Europe, uh, where the Nuremberg trials were conducted, IBM from the United States had a huge contract to provide interpreting equipment. <laughs> and uh, they focused on the simultaneous mode. And as a result, in many legal proceedings in Europe, the default mode in legal settings is simultaneous. In Australia and the United States, uh, and in the United Kingdom as well, the default mode in most legal proceedings is consecutive. Uh, and interpreters who get used to that are not necessarily developing the skill and strength to switch. Some interpreters who do conference interpreting, not legal interpreting, uh, focus on the simultaneous mode. So if you are trained in Australia as an interpreter, you usually choose the kind of practice arena that you're going to work in. And if you're going to work as a conference interpreter, then you will focus on learning how to do simultaneous interpreting. And if you're going to work in the community setting, for example, in hospitals, doing medical uh, work with patients and doctors uh, and interpreting there, you tend to use the consecutive mode. If you work in legal settings in Australia, the standard is usually consecutive. So which is better? There's just no universal guidance uh, on these, and are there differences, or does it not matter? The other thing that is going on globally uh, is that the profession of interpreting has really developed in the last few decades. And so that in different areas there are now ethics codes uh, to which interpreters must adhere once they become registered and accredited. And those in import into them standards of practice that are really important. Uh, for example, uh, the importance of being neutral, not uh, taking partisan uh, approaches to the task, not, not seeing yourself as an advocate for, for example, the victim uh, or the person whose language might be closest to yours. Um, and um, along with that comes a, a series of standards in terms of how people are actually accredited. And do you have to be accredited, for example, to work in medical settings in different ways than you do to work in legal settings? What sort of accreditation should apply to courts? And even if we look at legal settings, should the same accreditation standards be applicable to a police interview as uh, to a court proceeding? So, so there are many questions uh, surrounding this, but, but it seems as if there's a crying need for many standard operating practices to be developed and an evidence base to guide those. What you find too, because of all of, of the foregoing issues, is that um, there isn't a great deal of consensus on how you go about measuring accuracy.
So different accreditation bodies develop their own particular methods of how they rate interpreter skills. And I'll talk a little bit about the way that we have developed that in Australia, uh, but I want you to understand that other different accreditation bodies in different countries might have entirely different procedures. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's an issue too, in just in terms of how do you rank and rate people and decide whether they have accreditation at the highest level, an intermediate level, or uh, or something else. All right, so so um, I think most of most of these points I have uh, hit on in uh, the earlier slide. Um, I think most of that looks like it's a duplicate. I guess got in there because there was this particular example there uh, in that bubble um, of some terminology that we used in one of our studies um, and and uh, it highlights what I wanted to say about familiarity with local dialects and familiarity with local languages. So we conducted a study uh, recently in Sydney where we were working from uh, English into one of three languages. Uh, so we ran a simulated court trial where uh, the accused person was either Mandarin speaking, Arabic speaking, or Spanish speaking. And we used a simulated script. So the script was the same uh, in English, and then uh, we translated it for the suspect's version into one of those three languages. Uh, and because it was written in Australian English <laughs> in the first instance, uh, the Australian suspect who was, uh, when his occupation was an issue, he described himself as a brickie. Now that is, if you're English speaking, a word that you may never have encountered before. I certainly, um, you know, grew up speaking English in Johannesburg, South Africa, then in the United States, and if you'd asked me what a brickie was, I would not have known, even though I'm fluent in English. Um, but it is a term used to abbreviate a bricklayer or a stonemason or a mason. Uh, we found that our interpreters had enormous difficulty translating a word like bricky uh, into the target languages or into uh, or for uh, the police uh, into English. And so there were at some at some points the bricklayer became a tiler. <laughs> you know, um, or even a builder. So it was very difficult uh, to match that. So I just wanted to add that example from one of our studies uh, to highlight some of those differences that can emerge. All right, so looking now at some of the environments legally where interpreting occurs uh, raises another set of issues. Um, I've put up a few slides uh, to show you some of the differences in investigative interview settings. And I want to start with the extreme uh, uh, two slides with uh, the Norwegian uh, example first. Those are actually photographs of the interview room in which Anders Breivik, uh, the renowned uh, terrorist, um, uh, was interviewed multiple, multiple times. And I think what is most striking uh, to, to people more familiar with other interview and interrogation rooms is that it looks much more like a living room than a police facility. You know, there are soft furnishings, uh, there are actually curtains on the windows, comfortable chairs, you know, no imposing desk um, or other equipment. Um, and so uh, this raises the issue about um, uh, comfort and the, and the impact of physical comfort on people's capacity to provide useful information and whether that makes a difference. Um, that was not a situation where an interpreter was needed, but the interpreter would fit into that same living room type setting if uh, this was a Norwegian case. The other examples that I have here are probably more what you're expecting. So the top one is an example from Japan, and there you can actually see the interpreter uh, who uh, is sitting uh, at the desk with the computers. <laughs> um, and then the interviewer and the suspect are face to face. 
if you were conducting the interview uh, in the Norwegian setting, it's not clear that the interviewer uh, and the interviewee would necessarily be face to face. And the question would arise, where would you place the interpreter for the most effective interpreting? The third uh, photograph up here is an, is an interview room from uh, the Australian police facilities. It's one that is used for high-value detainees, such as terrorist suspects. Um, and um, in that one, we have a situation where the police interviewer is here, uh, the suspect opposite the interviewer, and the interpreter is placed in what we call a triangular position between the other two speakers, uh, therefore able to look very easily from one speaker uh, to the other, uh, but not opposite them. There, there's been a considerable debate about the best placement physically most effectively for the interpreter in an interview or a courtroom setting. If you do conference interpreting, oftentimes the interpreter is not even in the room. The interpreter is in a booth uh, and uh, uses headsets in order uh, to track the speech. Uh, and then the interpreting is transmitted to speakers in that language via headphones. So, so there are many physical arrangements. Uh, nowadays, when there are very portable wireless headsets available, um, some individuals who are trying to use more simultaneous equipment, for example, in United States courtrooms, uh, are using headsets even within the courtroom. Uh, sometimes to do simultaneous interpreting, which can also be called chuchotage, um, the interpreter has to really sit right next to uh, the speaker uh, to translate legal proceedings in a voice that is very quiet or sotto, uh, so that they don't interrupt the rest of the proceedings while doing simultaneous uh, interpreting. So, so placement can be a critical issue, and we were very interested in our studies in exploring the impact of different placements of interpreters on the accuracy of the renditions uh, and the outcomes. This uh, particular uh, figure here is from a study that just explored the impact of a whole set of interviewing strategies, um, including physical uh, comfort. So we, we looked at different interviewing strategies that police interrogators use. Some use what we call legal strategies, uh, primarily uh, to try to elicit information from suspects. Some uh, use uh, more coercive or less coercive practices that might be um, uh, you know, like good cop, bad cop routines. Uh, in the last several years, there's been a great shift away from more accusatory styles to what we call more information gathering styles that might uh, uh, involve more social strategies. Uh, and, and what we found when we compared those was that the social strategies were very effective um, in producing useful outcomes. So while you don't have to understand all of uh, the complex uh, statistics that went into this, uh, we did find that the social strategies, which included things like rapport building, establishing a human social connection or relationship uh, between the interviewer and the interviewee, was very critical in getting more rapid information, getting more information at all from a suspect rather than have them closed down or refuse to comment and in getting cooperation uh, in general although cognitive strategies were also useful in securing cooperation so if you're looking at sort of the science of policing and where that is going interpreters come into this arena where police may be using a panoply of these kinds of strategies and if interpreters are not aware of them they may simply omit them or change them in doing their interpreting uh, and 
and that may have some serious implications uh, for the the outcomes, uh, as well as um, you know dismaying uh, the police who are trained to do those specific strategies. Similarly, this particular figure here uh, just highlights again that the most effective strategies in producing cooperation and disclosure and admissions uh, were. Uh, all, all of, if you look above the line, uh, you will see that the non-coercive or friendlier conversational kinds of strategies using those social skills were the most effective ones. And so it's become very important to assess whether interpreters can in fact replicate the social strategies and skills uh, that the police interviewers may be using. Um, and I've highlighted that rapport building is one of those, uh, procedural justice uh, is another, um, and, and there are another series that really have built on some of the work of a social psychologist looking uh, at techniques such as reciprocity, uh, matching behaviors between the speaker and the recipient uh, in order to try to build a stronger social relationship. So, so those social issues you know, that are conveyed in language um, become very important uh, in these arenas. So we've highlighted that people have the right now to a competent interpreter, and this has been specially mandated by uh, the European Parliament and the Council of Europe, for example. Um, we've realized that people who are arrested by police or people going through trial proceedings are particularly vulnerable. So accuracy is important at those critical junctures in the justice process. Uh, we've uh, highlighted that interpreting skills vary, professional and ethical practices vary, you know, and, and I talked about neutrality. Uh, you know, there are other issues that arise as well. Sometimes uh, interpreters will, in will face many dilemmas and challenges if they subscribe, for example, to a code of ethics that requires them to be neutral, and then uh, the police interrogator uh, asks the interpreter not to translate something, uh, what should the interpreter do? Um, who is the interpreter going to be beholden to? Are they beholden to the courts, ultimately, or to one of the parties asking the questions? Um, if, uh, if there are uh, summarizations that occur, uh, uh, how should they address those? And if there are cultural differences, what sort of protocols should they follow to explain those? Um, so our first program of research was really just to talk to police officers out in the field doing interrogations, people who worked with interpreters, to try to ask them about their experiences and what they thought worked well, what they thought didn't work well. So we asked them about positioning of the interpreter. We asked them what sort of problems they had encountered. So it was a very qualitative set of studies, uh, internationally done uh, with different groups, and, and I, because I'm in Australia, I worked quite a lot in Australia and Southeast Asia, so I talked to people who worked in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Sri Lanka, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and what we found was that mostly they had experience, but they rated it uh, as a bit of an unpredictable experience and pretty high risk. Uh, and they were mostly worried about just accuracies but very worried about the loss of the rapport building skills uh, that they had been trained in and also that they often were concerned that they were losing control of the interview uh, through uh, the interpreter perhaps being um, uh, siding with one party, maybe taking charge too much, maybe taking too much of an, uh, an aggressive role in conversation management, um, which they might regard as their skill. But there were other police who thought that that was a great benefit, who really did see the interpreter as a team member. 
And sometimes in some police departments, uh, they have um, their own agents who are bilingual in the target languages, and then they use that individual as the interpreter. Uh, and that raises, of course, the questions about neutrality. Um, if somebody is really an employee of the police force, are they going to be as neutral as a freelancing independent interpreter through some other agency? There was there were some other studies that we looked at that have been done, usually on just small segments of actual police interviews, uh, which have shown that if there's much variation in the lexical choice of the interpreter, that itself can shift the extent to which someone looks guilty uh, to a court later on. So, so that highlights the importance of really faithful maintenance of uh, the language uh, and the lexical choices. Um, we ran a study a few years ago uh, one of our first interpreting studies where it was done in a courtroom and we were mainly interested in the courtroom setting in comparing credibility ratings that emerged uh, in a simultaneous versus a consecutive mode. So we had the same suspect who either gave his evidence monolingually or he gave it through an interpreter, and we used the same interpreter to do simultaneous interpreting or consecutive interpreting. And then we brought in a group of people who were jurors, uh, jury-eligible citizens who were mock jurors, and we asked them uh, how believable was the suspect if they saw, and they only saw one trial, so they saw either a monolingual or a consecutive interpreted or simultaneous interpreted trial. And we found that the credibility ratings were not the same. Uh, for the same individual saying exactly the same words in the same courtroom setting with the same lawyers, uh, the only difference was whether it was monolingual or interpreted and how it was interpreted. And the way it w turned out was that the simultaneous and the monolingual ratings of credibility were the same. But if the suspect gave evidence and the interpreter used the consecutive mode with that gap between uh, the information takes much longer to do interpreting consecutively than it does simultaneously, that seemed to boost the credibility ratings of the suspect in our study. Uh, and so, at the end of the day, there wasn't justice equivalence just based on that mode of interpreting. Uh, so we were very fascinated by those findings, uh, and we wanted to take a chance to explore that further uh, in looking at, at other issues associated with that. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the studies we did later on that same topic. We found that a lot of the research that exists out there just looks at what we call propositional content when they're coding for accuracy, and there's very little attention paid to other pragmatic equivalents such as tone of voice, pace of speech, uh, expression, mimicry, and so forth that is beyond just the content. Uh, and we also found that research didn't pay much attention to coordinating the turn taking if you are using consecutive mode or how you break up even things in simultaneous. If you look at most interpreting research, it's done in the form of discourse analysis. It's very rarely experimental and quantitative. And uh, some of those studies, uh, you know, I've cited some of the leading studies here by Nakane and Lion Mulayim. Um, they showed, even with just small segments of speech, that there was concern that the interviewing techniques were not replicated. All of those things I've talked about, such as rapport building or cognitive interviewing strategies or using you know, legal or other kinds of social mechanisms. Uh, we found enormous disagreement about the best placement of an interpreter when we talked to the practitioners. So quite a few practitioners actually thought it was best to have the interpreter behind the suspect. 
so that the interpreter uh, would not interfere with eye-to-eye -eye contact <laughs> between the interviewer and the suspect. And so they would put the interpreter right behind, and they wanted the interpreter to be more like a disembodied voice, <laughs> as if they were not even in the room. Um, and others, you know, would place them, you know, almost to the side, but, but further back. You know, and others wanted that triangular arrangement, which has often been used in other settings. So there was a dispute about how, what was best. And we found that no study had really compared the performance of trained interpreters and untrained bilinguals uh, or in-house agents. Um, and no one knew whether interpreters could in fact, reproduce these rapport building strategies. So those became some of our biggest research questions. Uh, this is a very interdisciplinary area of activity, and so there are many literatures that could inform this research. I've listed um, a group of those here that we have drawn on over the years in uh, working through this program of research. Um, and. Uh, and you'll see the strains of some of those coming through in our papers. So our biggest questions were, what are the factors that facilitate or impair accurate interpreting? So we've talked a bit about mode, consecutive versus simultaneous. Another issue that seemed to be very disparate was just how long an interpreter should be required to practice in a setting before they had a break. And we found vast disparities between the consecutive and the simultaneous practices. So in the simultaneous practice arena, conferences and otherwise, usually interpreters work in relay teams. And every 20 minutes, you get a new interpreter. So you're regarded as having about a 20 minute cognitive capacity and then you're considered to be fatigued and a new interpreter comes in and then you switch back after a break. In consecutive interpreting in courtroom settings, there are often 90 minute sessions, no breaks at all until there's a court recess. The interpreter just has to go, go, go all day taking breaks when the court takes a break, and there's no relief interpreter whatsoever. So it, it raised an important question about what are the optimal standards before fatigue kicks in, what are the cognitive demands of these different kinds of interpreting or interpreting per se. Um, we were interested in differences in language. We especially wanted to focus on some of those high profile, high frequency languages like uh, English, Mandarin, Arabic, and Spanish that we had access to in our backyard. Um, and we wanted also to take on board some of these issues about changes in practice in terms of whether the interpreter is present physically. What is the impact if you have a telephone interpreter? There are now books that you can find on telephone interpreting. There's a huge practice on Skype or video link interpreting, where sometimes the interpreter is the one who is present by Skype, sometimes it might be the questioner, you know, it could, you know, there are different ways to configure who is the present and the absent party, uh, and, and what works best there uh, is unknown. Most of our, um, our research, um, you know, also ultimately wanted to look at uh, perceived credibility, um, you know, but uh, we're still getting back to some of those questions. I have a new study running now on courtroom interpreting where we're trying to get back to those questions, and I probably won't spend more, much more time on that today, but I'll show you some preliminary results. Um, and so we realized we needed uh, to use qualitative as well as some quantitative approaches um, in this work. Um, for some of the fine-grained analysis, you probably need to do discourse analyses, drawing on a lot of linguistic traditions. I'm mostly trained as a, as a cognitive experimental psychologist, so I was interested in the quantitative ways of uh, comparing uh, these uh, issues. And what we were very interested in doing was having it live rather than just working from paper. So in our experiments, we simulated uh, what would occur because if we used just case-based transcripts, you, could, you, you couldn't really get the same control experimentally to draw the comparisons and inferences than was possible to us in our research designs um, with that simulation. So 
Um, we adopted what I'm calling the interaction process model that was developed in police interviews by Steve Mostyn. And that really focuses on the notion that there is an interaction between the speakers and the, inter the interpreter really is yet a third party in what is otherwise a dyadic interaction. So just figuring out what the difference is once you have a third party in that interaction uh, is, is a research question. We used a number of those kinds of predictive variables that I alluded to before in that diagram. Um, and we were interested in contrasting what we call high versus low context cultures. Oftentimes that breaks down into individualist versus collective cultures. Uh, many Asian cultures are more collective. Uh, you know, Australia and the United States, the UK tend to be much more individualistic in their focus. And so they are what we call low context cultures. Uh, versus many of the Asian high context cultures uh, because people communicate differently in those kinds of cultures. So, so culture became an issue as well. All right, so the first uh, issue that we uh, wanted to look at was if interpreters don't know much about police strategies, would it be helpful for them to have an information guide on what rapport is so that they can recognize it when they see it uh, and uh, uh, will, will this improve their performance in maintaining or replicating those rapport building strategies that are so crucial now uh, in police interviews. So in one study what we did was we had a pilot project to develop an information guide for interpreters on rapport and that is a picture of it. Um, if you want a full-scale version of it, just email me. I'll send you the whole thing. It's very brief. We condensed research findings uh, in order to do this, and then we used it in a subsequent study. But the pilot study itself was uh, just to have two basic groups, one group that got that information sheet and one group that didn't get it and people were randomly assigned to either that intervention with the information sheet or not. And then they responded to a whole lot of short vignettes about police interviewing foreign non-English speaking suspects about international crimes. Uh, and this study was run in the United Kingdom. The results showed that if they got the information sheet, uh, they were much more sensitive to recognizing rapport and what the cues were to rapport in the communication. So there were significant differences uh, there. Um, but we found that the groups performed equally well at identifying appropriate methods to convey rapport or avoid obstructing it the facilitators or, or the uh, barriers. Uh, and we used all of the feedback from the intervention group to make some more fine-tuning adjustments to that information sheet before we used it in a later study. Uh, so you can see there was a lot of preparation uh, and lead up to our study. So the next study that we did um, was to look at accuracy of the content maintenance of rapport and we divided rapport into two kinds of indicators we looked at rapport that is just in language uh, or verbal rapport and then we looked also at rapport in terms of what we called paraverbal or nonverbal markers and i'll give you some examples of those so we 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 thought that rapport was more complex uh, and needed to be broken down and coded differently and we also wanted to see what were the kinds of common errors that people made uh, because there wasn't much error analysis and we had a chance to do that. So we, we uh, secured some groups of trained interpreters and untrained bilinguals and our participants in our study were the interpreters. So we ran the same simulated interview over and over again and the only thing that was different was the interpreter. And that allowed us uh, to test those variables that I described. We also varied the placement of the interpreter, and we did that by having people, because, because we were uh, concerned about getting good control and statistical measures, we had the same interpreters interpret in two different positions. So they did one half of the interview sitting in a triangular position, and one half of the interview sitting uh, to the side behind uh, the suspect.
Uh, and we flipped the order of that randomly across the entire study so that there were no specific effects just on placement. Um, and that means our design was what we call a two by two by two mixed factorial design. The within participant feature was the placement and the between participant features were whether they were trained or untrained and whether or not they got that two page information sheet to sensitize them to rapport. Okay, so the script of the interview lasted about 25 to 30 minutes. We had police in Sydney look at it. They said it was a very realistic interview. It was all about a drug case. The suspect was accused of importing drugs. He was found with a kilo you know, of methyl amphetamine at his house. Uh, the interview included about 60 Q&A exchanges and was in the monolingual version, 1650 words. Um, and the inbuilt interpreting challenges uh, were various, um, the kinds of things that were assessed, and I'll come back to the assessment. First, I just want to clarify what we consider to be the verbal markers of rapport and the nonverbal markers. So verbal markers included th things that I've listed there, such as expressions of commonality, being like, affinity between the interviewer and the interviewee. Sometimes you can build rapport by telling a little bit more about yourself. So when we had our police interviewer self-disclose some facts about himself, that was a rapport building strategy that many police use. Um, sometimes uh, police deliberately use the first name or the last name of the interviewee to gain certain effects. Um, we did that. Uh, sometimes they express, you know, concern about the integrity or the well-being of the interviewee, so that can be a way to make them feel more comfortable. Um, they check whether they're following and understanding, even though there's an interpreter present. They use active listening techniques, acknowledging responses, rather than just preparing their next question. Um, and um, and they often use first or uh, second person, and we wanted to see if our interpreters did that, because sometimes interpreters actually switch to a third person. They talk about the individual. They don't, they don't replicate the I, me, my, or we. They say he said or she said or, uh, or talk about them in the third person. So that, was, that breaks down that rapport. Um, the nonverbal markers were things like the pace of speech. So if the interviewer spoke very quickly, did the interpreter replicate that or not? Uh, if there was a tone of voice that changed from formal to a little bit angry at certain times or to joking and friendly at other times, uh, how apt was the interpreter to be able to change their intonation? This is what we call the pragmatic force of the speech. It's a very critical part of interpreting training. The emotional variation um, uh, could be similar, uh, but not identical to tone. Uh, and that can also be evident in the facial expression. Sometimes, you know, some people use a lot of hand gestures. How much mimicry did the interpreter engage in uh, was part of that question to match the speakers, whether it was the office or not. These are just some further examples of each of those. You know, so to express solidarity, our interviewer said, we understand how it is in your country in terms of how police behave was the topic. Uh, you know, trust me, don't worry about it. Those were examples of insurances to make the suspect more comfortable. Um, being very polite. Um, could you please tell me what they found when they searched your home? Um, you know, giving the active listening, uh, things like, okay, right, that's right much more informal conversational responses at times, using the suspect's name or last name at different times. Uh, I would like to ask you, what do you say? Those were all uh, very testing for the interpreter to see what pronouns they would replace them with. And an example of self-disclosure, it turned out both the suspect and the interviewer had young children who were boys, uh, and so that was used as an affinity building uh, uh, rapport technique by the police interviewer. Okay, so we had 100 
interpreters. This study was run only English-Spanish. I'll come to some others where we used other languages. Um, we gave everyone a survey questionnaire, our participants, our interpreters, before they started. We wanted to know about their training, their accreditation, their personal experience in interpreting, what kind of interpreting settings they worked in, and what they thought their role was, how they thought they should do their job. Uh, they were all paid uh, about $100 for the 30-minute interview. And we recorded everything, transcribed it, but we had to code those nonverbals uh, in the interview, the, the performance on pace and uh, tone of voice, emotional mimicry, and so on, we coded at the time. So if you look at this photograph here of our experiment, that is our interviewer, that is our suspect, uh, feeling very miserable at that point. He was very emotional about the charges that were and the topic of the interview. That is the interpreter in the behind the suspect position. And this is one of our research associates. This is my co-author, Natalie Marchuk. She did all of the coding, uh, but we pretended that she was, in fact, an assistant to the detective because many times uh, the interviewing detectives work in pairs. And so she said she was taking notes to assist him, but in fact she was coding all of the behaviors of the interpreters um, throughout the session. We had a sample where we had pretty even numbers of uh, professionals uh, who were trained interpreters and bilinguals. Um, and our actors had no idea whether the interpreter sitting in the room coming in was an untrained bilingual or a professional practitioner. So they were blind to that. The results now, so they're quite a few. The first result I want to give you is what the interpreters thought their role was and how that affected their performance. And we found that there were differences that were vast between the trained interpreters and the untrained bilinguals, uh, especially you know, on things such as the requirement to be neutral and the duty to report every single utterance. So in most legal settings, people are trained that you should replicate everything that is said. Sometimes you will also be advised, if you're an interpreter, that if someone is hesitant, is using a lot of ums and errs, you need to replicate that hesitancy as part of your faithful interpreting. This is not information bilinguals who are not working as interpreters have any clue about. So you can see that in a few instances, they were fairly similar, but the lighter pink is the trained interpreters and the darker color the untrained. And you can see that on most of our measures about what you should do. Should, if somebody repeats an answer or repeats a question, do you have to do it? You know, the bilinguals were not so sure. If somebody swears and uses expletives and vulgar language, should you repeat it? Again, the bilinguals probably going to omit that and didn't think it was part of their job. If there were ambiguities, again, they don't, they're, they don't have a background or training to know how to address those. If somebody speaks ungrammatically, perhaps uh, for a variety of reasons, and you were the interpreter, do you sanitize the language and make it grammatical when you interpret it, or do you replicate the errors? These were, these were some complex issues for interpreters to grapple with uh, that were just out of the zone of familiarity to the untrained bilinguals. And then, you know, in terms of cultural differences, um, uh, in terms of how much you should be a cultural interpreter, um, you can see that some of those differences were a bit smaller, um, but by and large, uh, again, we see that the professional group is uh, got stronger agreement as to what they should do than the others. So, so you can see the the overall difference was 89 versus 57 percent, just in terms of how you perceive the accuracy of what you're doing, and this this is about the faithfulness of those renditions. Um, the next result um, has to do with uh, how we scored accuracy. 
just linguistic or propositional accuracy and overall interpreting. So this was quite a dilemma for us to decide in running our research. So we went to the professional accreditation bodies in Australia. There's a group called uh, Ausit and NATI uh, that run uh, training and accreditation programs. And we wanted to see uh, what sort of method they use. And, and, and we also talked to interpreting professors who train interpreters at university level or, um, or other vocational level courses in Australia. And um, the, one of the interpreting researchers with whom I collaborate uh, has uh, developed a way to assess students of interpreting that is now very similar to the way that accredited interpreters are assessed. And that means that you break down the proficiency into a number of subcategories. So you give people a score, for example, on just how well they do propositional content. Um, and so you're not coding every single utterance all the way through. Uh, these are fairly global judgments, but you're making them in segmented different areas. So then there's a judgment about accuracy of style, a judgment about how well people maintain the rapport markers. So you, you would, if you were an examiner or an accreditor, you would look through a recording of somebody's performance, and then you would give them a rating out of 10 on each of these particular attributes. So uh, in interpreting protocol has to do with, for example, you know, how do you introduce yourself? Where do you place yourself? How do you manage the conversation? Uh, we had a separate category just for the legal discourse and terminology because in a police setting or a courtroom setting, there's so much specialist terminology that's technical. So that's really different than just the accuracy of everyday language. Um, bilingual competence, you know, is one of those features. Um, and some of these are weighted differently. Uh, mostly the propositional content gets a higher score. Uh, the, the other two uh, also got slightly higher weightings. And that produced a mark out of 100 for every single interpreter just on uh, the accuracy dimension. This is how our groups uh, broke down in terms of how they performed at the end of the day. We divided our, our interpreting sample into three groups based on their responses to the training they had received uh, to become practitioners. So we had the untrained bilinguals, and they're in the light color. Uh, then the intermediate group are what were called the TAFE trained uh, interpreters. So those are people who've gone to a vocational training institute um, that is usually uh, at a, a tertiary level, but it's not uh, part of a university program where they get specialist training in interpreting. Uh, and then the there is the third group that are the university trained interpreters. They're usually doing a master's degree. Uh, it might take uh, one to two years uh, and they get some practice um, and uh, they might get more specialist training in terms of legal settings versus medical settings versus other settings. Um, but some of the TAFE programs might also include some of that training. And what you can see, um, uh, you know, across uh, each of those different rating categories that we used is that there was a pretty clear pattern with the bilinguals being, uh, you know, the lowest scoring, um, the TAFE group in the middle, and the university trained interpreters generally outperforming the other two groups. And those are, uh, those little bars are 95% error bars on the end. So, so that seemed to indicate that training and more of it made a difference in terms of accuracy on our rating scheme. The attributes um, of uh, proficiency were also scored in other ways. Um, and we did have multiple raters so that we were uh, getting some cross-validation or inter-rater reliability scores on proficiency. Uh, this looked uh, more globally at just what was competency. Um, and uh, if you scored on this side, um, you can see that that's where most of uh, the uh, untrained bilinguals uh, did the worst. There were errors and problems with proficiency in the other groups. Uh, but if we look at the attributes of strong, good reporting, um, again, the untrained bilinguals had the fewer uh, 
uh, of those uh, and the same pattern of more education in interpreting leading to better interpreting skills on our tests uh, emerged on that rating scheme as well. Now in terms of our rapport building, the, the verbal rapport, I've just collapsed people here between trained interpreters and untrained bilinguals. We see again a difference in the extent to which people maintain the rapport uh, in all of those different types of rapport. Um, sometimes they're closer, but, but the percentage of maintenance was higher by those individuals who were trained professional interpreters and the untrained bilinguals. So that drop-off occurred. Here are some examples of failures to maintain rapport markers. Um, if the interpreter had changed uh, the what we call the footing from I to we, and the interpreter was identifying with uh, the speaker by using that pronoun, we regarded that as an error. They weren't maintaining the rapport the way it was intended. If they changed uh, the speech from, you know, indirect, uh, I mean, from direct to indirect, uh, you know, so if the interviewer said, I would like to ask you, and they, the interpreter's version was, he would like to ask you, we would regard that as a breakdown in the rapport because they're making more distance by using that pronoun. Uh, if they say he wants to know what you say rather than what do you say, it's less direct, so that's not good rapport maintenance. And in one part of our script, we had a little side conversation that uh, where they, if they uh, were faithfully reporting, they would report everything. If the interpreter had a side conversation and did not interpret everything, that breaks down rapport again. So we counted that as an error. And then when they were just plain omissions, you know, if somebody said, can you please ask him what they found because there's a special effort of politeness by the interviewer and the interpreter just jumps to what did they find, you've lost all of that careful politeness uh, that has been embedded. So those are just some examples for you. But overall, we found that across the entire sample, about 70% of the rapport markers were maintained, about 30% were lost, but there was a big difference between our groups. So the trained interpreters were more likely to maintain them, and that was a statistically significant difference compared to the untrained bilinguals. Um, this simply depicts uh, exactly where those differences occurred between the nonverbal rapport features so that the bilinguals were very much less likely to maintain the expressions, the emotions, the tone of voice differences, uh, and the pace of the questioner. So. Um, we produced, we did some calculations to see statistically how those turned out, and we used Cohen's D's here. Uh, all of our scores on the Cohen's D scale uh, show that these are what you would call quite large effects um, in, in uh, the variation between those groups. Um, the, I think I've, I've pretty much covered that one, so I'll jump to just our summary here, that, that generally the ad hoc interpreters, we call them sometimes, or untrained bilinguals were less aware of the rapport markers, um, and they often use what we would call inappropriate styles of powerless speech or colloquialisms rather than replicating what the speakers were saying. Um, they oftentimes omitted any discussion of their role or to establish ground rules for uh, the proceeding of the interpretation, which uh, is one of the things that the professionals are trained to do. They switched the person, they breached ethical guidelines on impartiality, they did not interpret all of the utterances, and they were far less confident uh, in their abilities. Uh, whereas our trained interpreters, you know, were maintaining things that about four out of five rapport markers. Um, but we did, oh, I'll, I'll finish, we did not find that our information sheet was really successful. 
the information sheet was successful with the bilinguals, <laughs> with the untrained bilinguals, because they had uh, less training in how to do good interpreting. Whereas the trained interpreters had probably, through their schooling on the topic, uh, become much more attuned to the need to replicate the tone, replicate uh, the style, uh, do all of that pragmatic uh, work uh, that was really summarized on our information sheet. So if we just look across the board at our groups, did our information sheet make a difference? It was null, but if we looked only at the bilinguals, it really did improve their performance. But the trained interpreters outperformed them, you know, irrespective of the guy. In terms of placement, we had really interesting findings. So um, we found what we would call a sort of a practice effect finding, and it's a bit hard to see that uh, through, through all of this. But um, if you look at our uh, interpreters who are professionally trained or practitioners, you can see that their ability to uh, perform well, and this is just on verbal rapport markers, is pretty much invariant across all conditions because all of the lines uh, end in about the same place. So it didn't matter where they were placed and it didn't matter where they did um, the interpreting from behind, you know, in front first, first of all. But for the bilinguals, um, they uh, you know, they, they perform differently. So if they were uh, put in a triangular position, you could see that in the second half, uh, after some practice, they were doing more verbal rapport maintenance. And if they were placed behind the suspect, similarly, in the second half, um, they performed better um, than they did in the first half of the interview. So, so they improved over time as they got more used to the interview, but they started out quite poorly, no matter where they were placed. So I, I think our findings you know, indicated there that placement was less of a concern if you had a formally trained interpreter who was familiar with uh, some of the aspects of legal interpreting and police interviewing. Uh, the training definitely predicted fewer errors and omissions. And again, you know, we got some pretty uh, impressive effect sizes here. Um, and uh, overall, we would say that um, we, we think that we provided some very strong evidence that people should be very cautious about using ad hoc bilinguals in legal settings because of the drop off that occurred. Right, so now, now I want to uh, just turn to another uh, segment and focus on uh, some of the subsequent studies that we've done. Um, and in, in providing you a little more background, um, I think uh, this uh, set of uh, issues over here, the important ones are that there, there is not really a consistent body of research that you can turn to for guidance on the questions that I outlined at the outset. You find um, that when people have tried to compare, for example, performance on simultaneous and consecutive interpreting, that they haven't done it very systematically. Uh, there are some findings that I've listed there, you know, uh, when it's been looked at unimodally, uh, or that other times there are confounds uh, between the mode and whether the interpreter is present or remote, so you we couldn't tell what was causing some of the effects. Um, and and far, more, far more systematic, tight comparisons were needed to answer questions than existed in the literature, even though some people are looking at these similar issues uh, in different ways. The practical questions that we wanted to focus on next were which mode is optimal? Um, is phone and video interpreting as reliable as in-person interpreting? And what sort of cultural factors might impact uh, the interpreting performance? So those are uh, addressed in the next range of studies. Again, you know, um, we've done some surveys, uh, but what I'm going to focus on are some of our experimental methods. 
We've used that same battery of measures on accuracy and rapport. We've also uh, done the same assessment with surveys about people's training and experience. But what we've added in some of these studies is a new set of measures uh, that are quite exciting on cognitive load, uh, looking at where the interpreters fix their gaze and, and what and cognitive load is also very important because if you can track how often people blink and the size of their pupils, that is now determined to be quite a reliable indicator of how much cognitive work you are doing uh, during the performance of the interpreting task. So we wanted to add those kinds of physiological measures to all of these other less uh, physiological measures to try to get further insight into those questions about uh, the mode uh, and the remoteness, the presence. Um, I wanted to step back a moment and just talk a little bit about some of the challenges with certain linguistic communities. This is not the only linguistic community, the Arabic speaking community to which these points apply, uh, but I wanted to highlight it for you uh, because it's so it, it's such a feature of uh, the Australian context. So we have uh, quite a sizable Arabic speaking community in Australia, but they're not uniform. They don't all speak the same uh, form of Arabic, even though they live in the same country. They have many dialects, and they may some may come from Egypt, some may come from Lebanon. Uh, in terms of their family history, uh, there, there, are large, there are large differences. Um, when you study interpreting uh, in the Arabic community in Australia, you find that uh, mostly you're expected to be facile in modern standard Arabic. Uh, as well as certain dialects, and the dialect might be based on bo somebody belonging to one of those language groups that I've mentioned. Um, we collected a sample of Arabic interpreters in these studies. We found that about 90% of them had actually got accreditation in Lebanese or an Egyptian dialect, so those seem to be the most dominant in our Arabic-speaking community. But what is important to know is that the modern standard Arabic is not really a common uh, what I would say lingua franca, not everybody knows it. And although legal documents tend to be written in it, very few people actually are facile and competent in it. So most commonly, and in, in our study, about 86% of the Arabic interpreters who work with us use dialects. And, and that's typical of what you find in Arabic interpreting in Arab countries as well. So it raises the issue that if you have, you know, for example, um, someone who is very good at Egyptian Arabic dialects and the suspect is Arabic speaking but comes from a Lebanese community, uh, they're not going to understand each other very well because the dialects are quite diverse and you may miss cultural cues. So, so we had enormous difficulty in our study. It was very time consuming doing all of the coding, taking into account these different dialectical variations, even hiring actors to perform in our studies, you know, meant choosing between different dialect groups. Um, and and we, we used a lot of different Arabic codas uh, to produce these results. So this raises some issues about who is the best kind of interpreter uh, to get uh, cross-culturally. There's been some very good work by linguists on the types of failures that occur in interpreting, and they distinguish uh, some of them between pragmalinguistic and socio-pragmatic failures. Um, what that means is that sometimes um, you can literally translate the words uh, and the intent, but you will produce a mismatch if you don't really know the cultural significance of a particular dialect. And one area where that tends to be most pronounced is when you are talking about what are called verbal taboos. Um, and those vary by language, you know, so in many uh, different languages, Anything to do with sexual behavior can be a verbal taboo. So this has huge implications in cases that involve sexual assault, for example. In other, uh, in other uh, situations, cultural taboos might have to do um, with vulgar language or swearing. Uh, 
um, particularly cultures where religion is very important. And so that, that is uh, a taboo topic uh, in many Arabic dialects. Uh, and it, and of course, uh, you know, is uh, an issue that can be important in some uh, terrorist kinds of investigations or other criminal investigations. Um, and so we found that there were some strong differences of opinion uh, in the literature as to whether interpreters really need to be undertaking the role of being a cultural broker uh, or just stick to uh, the verbatim utterances and provide appropriate interpretations of those. Um, and the more you encounter these taboo topics, <laughs> the more that cultural brokerage becomes significant. So, so um, uh, I don't need all of those examples here. You know, if, for example, this one here will highlight it. If somebody uses a, a, some kind of a swear word, uh, an expletive, as the suspect or the police interrogator, and the interpreter comes from a culture where that is a taboo to use, um, they're not going to translate it. They'll say something like, he called you a bad word. And you don't know what the word is, or you don't know how bad it is. You don't know the level of the insult that might be uh, associated with that or not. And, and that person is then stepping into the cultural brokerage role by sanitizing the language because that's culturally appropriate for them, but it's not fulfilling the faithful interpreting role. So people get caught in these role conflicts quite easily once you move into the taboo arenas. So we were interested in at least putting some uh, swear words um, and vulgar language in our script to see how different interpreting groups would respond to them. Um, there is some literature that provides some guidance on who police might want to use. Uh, if you're choosing an interpreter and they use uh, some language you might not be familiar with, they divide people into endo group and exo group interpreters. So an endo group interpreter is someone who belongs to the mainstream community. So if you were an endo group interpreter in Australia, you would probably have grown up with English as your native language, and you would have learned the target language. You know, in our study, that was either Mandarin or Arabic or Spanish. You would have learned that um, through study. You would not necessarily share the culture, so you would be probably less sensitive to any of those taboos um, because it wasn't your mainstream culture. You tend to have a gap then, um, and the risk of miscommunication can go up. If you're an exo-group interpreter, you are most often someone who is a migrant to the mainstream culture where the legal interpreting is occurring. Uh, and so you have that cultural affinity and that cultural competence that the endo-groups do not have, but the risk of behaving like a cultural broker goes up. <laughs> Uh, and you might be much more likely then to use euphemisms rather than these uh, vulgar language expletives. Or you may interpret, you may be much more engaging in face-saving uh, behaviors than somebody who is an endo-group interpreter. So, so what they say is that regarding these taboos, there's more comfort with the endo-group interpreters for the speakers, they feel less of a facial threat. Sometimes the interpreters have a, a you know, face-saving uh, issue to deal with as well. Uh, but despite the comfort, there will be less knowledge <laughs> about it. So, so it is a dilemma in choosing an interpreter there. Um, Here's, here's a clear example. In many Arabic cultures, uh, the taboo about sexual matters is so strong that if somebody says, I have a cold, you might translate that as a cold, but if you were somebody familiar with Arabic dialects and with Arabic euphemisms, you would understand that that means a sexually transmitted disease. So, so, so you can't use the literal world. It's you know you've got to know um, what the taboos are uh, to be culturally competent. You know, similarly, uh, we have huge problems with our indigenous community in Australia, where it's considered polite to say yes to everything. 
This is disastrous in legal interviews and legal settings. If you ask if you did something that is, you know, the reprehensible act, uh, the actus reus, and you're being polite, and you're following your cultural prerogatives, and you say yes, um, you can be uh, found guilty of something you never did simply because of these linguistic patterns. Similarly, it's considered very appropriate in indigenous cultures to say nothing a lot of the time. So groups will sit in silence. They have not like the American prerogative to fill up uh, the airspace with noise. Um, it's, it's very normal for no one to say anything uh, and it's not required. But try doing that in a police interview with someone from a different culture and you can be interpreted as resistant, non-compliant, etc. So, so, so it's, you know, you, you have to um, uh, pay attention. This, this example here comes from a transcript of um, an interpreted interview where the interrogator said, tell him he's an idiot. For an, this was a negotiation. Um, and the interpreter said, he won't accept your offer uh, because it was considered far too confronting to use language like tell him he's an idiot in the language uh, that was the target language uh, of the interpreter and uh, of the other party. Uh, so so those, are, those are examples of the brokerage. All right, so here are some examples of our preliminary findings uh, in response to the interpretation by our language groups of those two examples uh, that we combined of vulgar language that we put into our interview. And then we looked at the extent to which different language groups maintained that profanity. We had a sample of 98 interpreters, roughly about a third in each language group. Our language groups were Spanish, Arabic, and Mandarin. And the black dotted line represents overall the interpreters. And we varied uh, in, in this display whether they were doing the interpreting face-to-face via telephone or via video link. What you can see here is that the maintenance of profanity uh, was um, the proportion going up this scale here was lowest by uh, the telephone uh, in, uh, in all of the groups, but, but not the same. But uh, the red line is the Arabic group, so they're going to leave out the profanity more than any of the other language groups, no matter what the presence of the interpreter is, because it's a it's a taboo. Um, in terms of uh, the Mandarin speaking interpreters, the intermediate group, they were much more even across all of the three modes. Actually, you you know you can see that their line is the straightest, perhaps, but a little a little uh, lower um, uh, in in phone perhaps, um, not much, not significantly, um, and, and quite a bit of editing uh, of uh, the Volga language. And our Spanish speaking group um, was most faithful about including the profane examples, but they tended to do most of it in video link and a little bit less in person. And, and the least of it on the phone. But there probably is not a huge difference between the, the video and the in-person, but clearly uh, they felt more comfortable uh, keeping it there in video than they did face-to-face. -face. Uh, so so uh, it, it just highlights, you know, that if you're going to uh, be dealing with any kinds of communication where vulgar language or expletives or profanity is part of it, uh, you need to give your interpreters some very clear guidance on how you want them to respond. This is an example of how they would respond without any specific policy guidance from, uh, the, in our case, the researchers. Our police uh, interviewer did not tell them uh, what to do in the event of vulgar language. In, in looking at the kinds of cultural difference values, and you know, some of this comes from uh, different sources, um, you know, it seemed as if what was at play here mostly was some of those issues about direct versus indirect communication in high versus low context cultures. 
um, with the Spanish, you know, I mean, even Spanish is quite a, a high uh, context uh, culture and our Spanish interpreters uh, in Australia can be from quite a few Spanish speaking countries if they're uh, migrants. Um, you know, so we get quite a lot from South America. Um, you know, obviously, if you if you were doing this in the United States, a lot of those would be from Mexico and from Puerto Rico, um, and there are differences uh, uh, across those as well. But that they tend to be somewhat more high context cultures, certainly than Anglo cultures. Um, but expressiveness is also the extent to which emotions are displayed and shared is a cultural difference variable as well. And that plays into the rapport information that I have been discussing. Um, with these same groups, when we looked at the verbal pragmatic force and the nonverbal pragmatic force, you can see that there are some uh, differences in the way they respond. Um, the first figure here shows you the phone, the video link, and the in-person interpreting. And you can see here that there's much more likelihood, uh, particularly among the Mandarin speakers, uh, to maintain the pragmatic force in person. And it dropped off. It was still strong in video, but dropped off mostly by phone. Um, and the pattern in the other two groups was similar in that it, you know, I mean, with the Arabic, it's it's fairly close in person and audio, and slightly stronger uh, in video. And um, with the Spanish-speaking group, uh, probably also strongest in the video. Um, you know, it's not always clear why. We get uh, vast differences just in the type of nonverbal behavior uh, that is maintained. Um, with much more attention to pace and emotions and less uh, to face and bodily gestures. Um, and that is ignoring uh, the telephone group because we couldn't look at gestures um, or uh, facial expression in just the telephone only group. Um, all right, so I spoke a little bit about duration, and we're going to come back to that. Um, we did just compare duration across language because that may have some cognitive impact. We found that the duration of our interpreting uh, sessions here uh, with people splitting their interpreting between consecutive and simultaneous in this study. So, so if you remember in the other study, we had as a within participant variable the placement of the interpreter. In this one, the within participant variable was the mode of interpreting. So they either started doing consecutive and then did the second half in simultaneous, or they started in simultaneous and did the second half in consecutive. And we randomly assigned them to those conditions. There were a small number of people who were so poorly equipped to do uh, simultaneous uh, that even when they were assigned to do simultaneous, they pretty much did consecutive because they don't practice in the legal arena in simultaneous. So we, ha we had a, a control for, for uh, their presence uh, in the sample. But overall, the interview duration was vastly different across the sample with you know a range of 22 to 44 minutes, even with all of them doing both. The Spanish-speaking uh, interpreters uh, were faster than the Mandarin and the Arabic-speaking interpreters overall. Um, if we looked at uh, the, their training, all of those findings were independent of training or experience. So it simply seemed to be you know, associated with the language. Um, in the monolingual version, because we had an English-only version, Parts one and two combined took 16 minutes. So that gives you the baseline that we were working from. With the interpreting, if they did simultaneous um, in first, um, then overall the length was 26 to 38 minutes. If they did consecutive uh, you know, first, the overall length was 33 to 49 minutes. So uh, that seemed to establish a slower pace overall. Um, so, so quite interesting, you know, in terms of the implications for how long a trial may take or how long an interview may take uh, if you use these uh, different uh, forms of interpreting. 
Um, you can see from the figure that I've put up there that the in-person was faster than the video and the phone was the slowest. So the more remote the presence of the interpreter, the slower the entire operation. So it's much faster, more efficient to do it in person. The video, uh, you know, was uh, not bad by comparison, but quite a, quite a drop off. So if, if timing and effort and cognitive energy are crucial, uh, those are the, the trends. Um, I think I think overall, um, oh, and we asked people subjectively how much they thought the cognitive load changed between simultaneous and consecutive themselves, since they did both. Um, we found that their predictions of cognitive load uh, did not match at all our objective measures of their cognitive load, so they lacked insight into their own cognitive load and I'll come back to the empirical measures of their, of their cognitive load. But overall, I would say that from uh, that's, that set of findings, we would certainly say that interpreting face-to-face -face seems to be the best practice, <laughs> uh, and that maybe we need to be a bit more cautious about some of these remote practices. There were differences in terminology. The more remote you were, it just magnified all of the problems culturally, linguistically, as well as the time. Um, and um, sometimes the interpreters would use more words, but they would actually convey less information. So there was more talking, but not necessarily on target. And perhaps they were doing that because they were compensating for the lack of visual cues. So this led us to be much more interested in what is really going on face to face that makes it more efficient. What, what is the difference? Um, and so I'm going to show you next some of our studies using eye tracking equipment that gave us some more insights into what happens face to face. So we used, uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Stephen Doherty at the University of New South Wales, um, who has done interpreting studies using eye tracking equipment. Uh, he joined us for uh, these studies. And um, what you do is you have a bar that goes at the bottom of a screen. So you can't really use this for in-person only. Uh, we use this mainly, um, oh sorry, you can't really use it for a telephone because you don't have the screen, but we, we set people up in a room um, and um, they get synced with this eye tracker at the bottom of the screen um, and it allows them to move their heads uh, for normal interpreting activities like taking notes and so on and we were interested in what would happen then with a consecutive interpreting where they are very reliant on note taking. Um, and we measured two different aspects with this eye tracker. We measured cognitive load, which um, is done by looking at uh, the pupil size dilation in the pupil that gets recorded by the eye tracker more than anything else. And then we also measured visual fixations, where your eye shifts to um, uh, while you're doing the interpreting. And this just gives you some idea of what our main areas of interest were, um, and certainly where the fixations occurred. You'll see how people fixated. Um, so these bubbles are examples of data points from one particular interpreter, and they give you some idea about how often people are fixating on either the interviewer uh, or the suspect. So our interviewer is the one with the tie, <laughs> he's the police interviewer, the detective, and the suspect is in the t-shirt. So uh, there's some difference uh, in that that we used uh, to aggregate uh, these measures. And um, what we have here in this figure is a depiction of, uh, first of all, the cognitive load on the left. So the red line just measures the blink rates, and uh, the purple line measures the pupil diameter. Um, and uh, the more you blink, the more your cognitive load is increasing. The bigger your pupils get, the more your cognitive load is increasing. Uh, what that showed to us is that there was a greater cognitive load in the consecutive interpreting across all of our participants in the different languages than in the simultaneous interpreting. And this is a really surprising finding. 
because if you look at the linguistic literature and you poll the interpreters as to what they think is most demanding on them, they will say that it's much harder and more difficult and more cognitive load experienced in simultaneous than consecutive. But our objective data uh, did not uh, validate that subjective viewpoint and a common viewpoint that you find in the literature. Um, if you look at our second uh, figure there, that is just from the eye fixation or the gaze time. Again, looking at the simultaneous mode versus uh, the consecutive mode, and this is all measured within participant initially, uh, because they both did both modes. Um, you can see that there's far more eye fixation gaze time across the interview in simultaneous than in consecutive mode. Um, and that's primarily because in the consecutive mode, the interpreter has a notepad and is making notes in between all of those segmented utterances and then looking back at the notes. And then what we realized uh, from some of the data, and I don't know if I've got a depiction of it, maybe in these slides here you can see uh, how it works more. Um, you can see that the pattern of the fixations in simultaneous and consecutive mode is vastly different. And what is actually going on in the consecutive mode when people look up from their notes, um, they're spending a lot more time just looking around generally before they can settle down and fixate their gaze on the speakers again. Whereas in the simultaneous mode, because they don't have that break in visual contact because of the note taking, uh, they're able, you don't see anything floating around on the periphery to the same extent, and you just see this density uh, focused on the speakers. So uh, that, that seemed to account for it. So we realized that actually fixing your gaze takes time uh, and cognitive effort uh, in the consecutive mode uh, that we weren't aware of. So what did we learn? Well, big, uh, if you know, or uh, a Cohen's D of 0.53, uh, sh uh, you know, showing that there was much more time on notes than uh, on the speakers um, across all languages when they were in the consecutive mode, um, and uh, that everyone tended to focus more on the police interviewer than on the interviewee, to our surprise, because <laughs> you think that uh, the suspect's answers will be uh, the most critical and the most important, but in fact it's the interviewer who garners the most attention. Maybe that's good if they're using special interview techniques. We also saw that the cognitive load um, measured by the pupil diameter just keeps increasing across the experiment, so it's slowly aggravate, aggregating. Um, and um, and as, as you could see from those diagrams, it's far higher uh, in the consecutive than the simultaneous interpreting. Um, and we also noticed a pattern that once uh, the cognitive load was much higher towards the end of the interview, for example, visual attention sometimes was broken away from the speaker just to seek relief uh, for the cognitive load. So those were uh, some of the findings just on the eye pattern. So what about the accuracy? <laughs> what does this tell us uh, you know, uh, about simultaneous and consecutive accuracy? Well, we did some correlations with all of those measures. We focused here on uh, the general accuracy measures, the rapport measures, verbal and nonverbal, and on management of the interaction, because we thought those were the three key features of interpreting performance. Um, and we were able uh, to uh, compare how much gaze time and fixation time or shifts of attention there were, um, and then uh, relate those uh, to those measures. And I think I have some other summaries. So this is a verbal summary of some of those findings. Um, definitely accuracy had the strongest correlation with more gaze time. Um, and both rapport and management of the interaction um, were strongly correlated with shifts of attention as opposed to plain gaze time. So the way we understood that, uh, as I've put there in the bold text, is to say that the longer the interpreters fixated their gaze on the speakers, 
the more accurate they were. So that was what was happening in the simultaneous mode. The more they shifted their attention between speakers, as opposed to just looking away to make notes, the better they did at rapport maintenance and interaction management. So being able to uh, take both speakers into account really assisted them. And perhaps uh, those are things that are less easy to do if you're a remote interpreter, just beamed in you know, by Skype or uh, from a video link, uh, perhaps you have less capacity uh, to do that. Um, I have some of the same outputs here as we looked at earlier, just comparing modes. If you look at the consecutive mode, which is in the white bar and the gray bar is simultaneous, you'll see that simultaneous uh, is better in every instance across all of our measures of uh, accuracy, uh, although the differences are not huge. And that's because we're looking, um, I guess, at the same speaker, the same interpreter. <laughs> Uh, who is doing, uh, you know, uh, the scoring. Uh, so we've got every, you know, it's the same person's skill, right? Uh, and we're just uh, switching whether that person performs differently uh, from one mode to another. So they've got fundamental skills. But uh, the differences were statistically significant, but uh, the differences were not huge. Um, we found overall, you know, using different kinds of statistical analyses, here are some ANOVAs, um, that there's more accuracy again, this validated it in the simultaneous mode, and importantly, that held for all three languages. Uh, so um, uh, those language differences, no matter what language tree you belong to, etc., the interpreting task uh, seems uh, to draw on the same invariant set um, of uh, skills uh, from different language pairs. Okay, so I'm just checking the time a little bit here. Um, what I wanted uh, to do was to come back to uh, the credibility issue and the, and the cultural issue and share with you uh, where this might go to next. Um, you know, once, once you've uh, got optimal accuracy, in fact, what happens uh, when the interpreted uh, suspect uh, is assessed by fact finders in the mainstream language? And so in order to get those data, we were running a court study where we had jurors uh, who were eligible to serve in the New South Wales jury system come in and spend um, you know, a half a day with us as participants in the study, sit through a fully uh, uh, enacted live mock trial in a courtroom. They were all in the jury box. Um, and we ran uh, different groups of jurors. Uh, who attended the same trial in a monolingual version in English or in the language pairs of, uh, as you've seen, Spanish uh, and Mandarin uh, that are reported here. I do not have any other groups. Um, on, I don't have the Arabic group. I don't think we had the data yet when we produced this graph. We do have it now. Um, but but um, the the results are really um, quite shocking, I think, um, if you look at the difference. So the blue lines um, are, uh, if, we, if we have up, up this scale, guilty votes, you'll see that the blue bars uh, exceed uh, the number of guilty verdicts um, in Mandarin than for the same trial with the same actors except for the suspect uh, in Spanish. And that was the case whether we ran the trial in English, whether the interpreting was simultaneous or consecutive. Um, and then the final pair of bars at the end is just the overall uh, summary results across all. Um, and so if you were, um, you know, a Mandarin-speaking suspect, um, and and you were tried for exactly the same offence, I mean, the script was identical. Uh, the only thing that was different was the language and the interpreters. Um, you would want to 
I think, be very cautious about the simultaneous mode because for some reason that produced um, the highest guilty verdicts in this trial. Um, and in fact, the consecutive appears to be much more like the monolingual. So what is very perplexing um, about this result is that it is entirely the opposite to the result that we obtained the previous time in our courtroom study with Spanish interpreting. Um, in this particular study, we again see an advantage um, uh, that uh, is to the Spanish-speaking suspect in the simultaneous mode in comparison with the consecutive mode. So there's something, you know, that is, that is clearly an interaction going on here in terms of how our English-speaking mock jurors uh, in understood and assessed those individuals, not only in terms of the interpreting mode, but just uh, the language issue uh, made a huge difference. And we, we need to assess that. I mean, one is tempted if you are, uh, you know, living in Australia today to say that perhaps there is some basic um, xenophobia and racism uh, against Chinese-speaking individuals, uh, the, the Mandarin-speaking suspect that is coming through, that is driving some of the main effects here, that has nothing to do uh, with the mode. But beneath that, we can see this other pattern where there's an opposite effect for the guilt ratings of the Spanish-speaking versus the Mandarin-speaking suspect, depending on the mode of interpreting. So we have two kinds of, uh, of issues here, uh, the magnitude of the difference in the guilt verdicts overall, and then the opposite uh, patterns in the findings. Uh, so this you know, has left us with a whole lot more to explain and unpack. We did videotape all the deliberations of those mock jurors. Um, and we have transcribed them, and we are starting to code the decision-making processes and reasoning of the mock jurors so that we can provide better answers, which I don't know yet, um, as to the reasoning that was followed in each of those juries that rendered these verdicts. Um, and, we will, and we also now have, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember if we did we run. I think this one we may not have run Arabic interpreting. That's why they're not here. It wasn't that these ones weren't coded yet. We had, as as I mentioned before, so much difficulty um, really attracting a sufficient number of Arabic speaking interpreters uh, without all of the complications of different dialects that wouldn't match our our suspect. <laughs> Uh, that um, we preferred to run the study uh, just with the Mandarin interpreters, uh, you know, because there were not the same cultural differences in the dialect issues uh, that were apparent. So, so I don't have any Arabic-speaking suspect data uh, to compare in this study at this stage. Um, but, you know, it, it clearly raises an issue that one needs to look at those language issues uh, on guilt factors in the future. Okay, so I'm going to move towards summing up now um, with a series of uh, what I hope are some best practice implications uh, and applications to come out of this body of research from the studies that I have drawn upon in our research program. And I guess uh, one of the first points you know, that I've emphasized already is that you need, I think, trained and accredited interpreters, and you need people who have some specialist legal training as well. Uh, to deal, uh, and the differences between what the demands are in a police interview and what goes on in a police interview and what goes on in a courtroom setting. And you need specialists who are acquainted with both of those. And in fact, um, uh, you know, I mean, our, our study clearly showed that the higher the level of training, the better the performance, um, and, and we would be very cautious about doing what has been done so much in the field, you know, in Afghanistan and in Iran, in Iraq, and so on, where people have used bilinguals on the street uh, to provide interpreting services uh, in exigent circumstances. Um, you might, you know, you need to check those very thoroughly and carefully afterwards if you're going to rely on them. Um, 
I think it's really important that we have found very few language differences overall. Um, the credibility issues aside, in terms of the accuracy, in terms of the faithfulness of interpreting, our, you know, our effects um, really were um, much more dramatic when we looked at presence of the interpreter than linguistic differences. There may be certain language pairs. Our, all of ours, you know, were English too, not uh, out of those three languages. There may be certain language pairs where there are differences that we haven't tapped into. You need to c uh, consider that. Um, we certainly found that um, the information guide or giving people information about rapport was useful but mainly for people who didn't have that specialist training already that might have covered the same points. Uh, but I think it's a good practice to give your interviewers guidance on the kinds of interview techniques in an interview setting. So if your police practitioners favor using things like a cognitive interview, it's a very good idea to explain to the interpreter what that is so that when you start asking questions in certain ways, they know that this is part of that technique and to replicate it. Uh, similarly, you know, for all of those rapport building social strategies uh, that we outlined. So information in advance is probably a good idea uh, as well as embedded into some training courses. In terms of the cultural issues, you know, I, I guess uh, it seems that there are some good arguments to be made for having exogroup members uh, for certain uh, parts of it, but you need to decide whether the context of the interpreting task is one where perhaps an endo group member might be better uh, and, and weigh those risks depending on what you think will, ha will happen. I think all police practitioners and court practitioners should be given copies of interpreters' codes of ethics so that they know what a good interpreter is aspiring to do uh, and what their, what their accreditation requirements uh, are in terms of their ethical codes, in terms of neutrality, in terms of how to uh, introduce uh, the, themselves to the parties, in terms of how to manage cultural issues, etc. Those things are usually spelled out in the ethics codes. And then I think uh, in these settings, it's really critical to give the interpreters explicit guidance on how to deal with emotional expressions and gestures, all of those paraverbal and nonverbal cues, how to deal with things like profanity, taboo topics, whatever those are, and especially some guidance on what to do when they encounter dialectical differences, um, because that can lead to a lot of undoing. You also need to really have a protocol in place on how you're going to address cultural gaps and misunderstandings so that interpreters are not caught in a dilemma where they're unsure whether they should be adhering to their ethics codes to just faithfully, verbatim, neutrally interpret everything, or whether you expect them to say, look, this is an area where there's no exact uh, verbal equivalent and there might be cultural differences in how we use language about this topic. If you want the interpreter to undertake that role, you need to let them know in advance and allow for it, um, you know, in a break in the interpreting and, and have a, a setup in mind. Do you want them to go off the record? Do you want to break the interview? How do you want to deal with those things? Just during natural breaks, etc., so that so that there are no surprises. Optimally, it seems that interpreting in the simultaneous mode is best and with the greatest opportunity for gaze uh, that promoted a greater accuracy and the opportunity to make those visual shifts between the speakers because that is part of the communication that is being observed and interpreted. And if people can't uh, see both speakers because they've been placed behind one <laughs> or because the interviewer thinks that they're better outside of the room and doing everything remotely, those are the, the threats and the risks that will be at loss. Um, the interpreter uh, placement, you know, next to or behind the suspect, we would say you should avoid. Um, maybe the triangular placement, uh, such as you saw in one of those slides, is really uh, the optimal um, if you're not doing it via video link. And clearly, due to some of the cognitive load findings and the steady deterioration um, in uh, in uh, performance that can occur over time, it's probably a good idea to allow more frequent breaks 
uh, in consecutive report reporting and interpreting than anyone has ever thought are necessary. They're only uh, standard uh, in simultaneous. So we need to take into account the findings of the greater cognitive load there. In terms of where we're going in the future with this kind of research, I think that there are many opportunities. This is a transdisciplinary uh, type of activity. And when I use the word transdisciplinary rather than interdisciplinary, um, I use that advisedly to take into account that that means sharing not only the problem, but also really having people from different disciplines contribute to the solutions. And I, and I think that our collaboration uh, has been effective in a transdisciplinary sense because we have had uh, people who are legally trained, uh, people who are cognitive psychologists, forensic psychologists, uh, as well as uh, interpreting professionals um, and practitioners uh, have input uh, into this kind of study. And we've also consulted with uh, police practitioners along the way. But there's room, there's room to do more. Um, I, you know, I think all of those disciplines need to have input. I think that, that some of the strengths of the research that I've outlined have included those with yoke designs. By yoke design, I'm really referring to the studies where we built in the interpreting experimental manipulations and added the jurors <laughs> so that we were yoking two entirely different kinds of decision-making issues. We had two lots of samples. We, in fact, had samples of uh, independent neutral observers, as well as our samples of the interpreters, uh, both in the same study, a very cost-effective way um, to get what uh, simulates uh, closely a real-world uh, experience because it's a live experiment. The um, the mixed qualitative and quantitative methods, I think, are additional strengths. So as we have been publishing this research, we have divided it among some journals that have a greater focus on qualitative uh, presentations. Most typically, those are in uh, linguistics and interpreting. Uh, and some of the more hardcore quantitative outcomes, we have generally targeted towards some of the cognitive psychology journals. Um, and, and But we're very aware that you need to keep translating these results um, uh, for the different user groups and different disciplines who may not be so facile uh, in, in understanding all of the components of each of those. Um, I think that the randomization that we were able to achieve in our controlled experiments really allowed us to tackle some issues that had not uh, before previously been addressed in empirical research. Uh, we, you know, we did rigorous work f with lots of inter-rater and intra-rater reliability uh, with panels, especially on some of the detailed coding that I haven't really had time to discuss with you today because I've focused on bigger picture outcomes. Um, I think error analysis in the future needs a great deal of attention. That's sort of where we're working now. Um, it takes a great deal of time to do the coding of the errors. You look at the omissions, you look at the commissions, you know, and, and you tot up their, their effect. It's a very different kind of coding than the assessment rubrics that I outlined and reported to you today that were based on the interpreting courses. Um, you know, once we come to our jury deliberation data, we need also to be uh, sentient about the fact that we want to do multi-level analyses because we do have individual outputs from the individual jurors as well as jury outputs as groups and um, and and only once we've gone through those analyses will we be able to see the relationship between those. I think there's a great amount of research that can be done um, on natural language data uh, in the deliberations or in other interpreting situations using our chunks of interpreted text, using text mining approaches. Um, some pieces of software that are useful there are Leximancer or Tiny Text Miner that can be really helpful. For example, in some of our recent courtroom trial studies, there are very long sections that the interpreters have to address of opening statements and s judicial summations, you know, which are long narratives. Uh, and so those are, are very useful to apply this kind of strategy uh, to uh, to use text mining to see uh, within participant uh, sort of patterns there. In terms of future policy and reform guidance, 
I think we've produced some on modes of interpreting. It needs to be replicated uh, before it can be extended. Uh, we're seeing some pitfalls, but this is uh, very unique, very cutting edge, uh, fresh data on this topic. And so um, we're happy ourselves to be doing some additional replication with different samples to see if it stands up. We think that a great deal of work needs to be done in developing ground rules for both in-person and remote interpreting. They don't exist very well yet. There should be lots of ground rules about the video display so that those will capitalize on providing the interpreter with great visual access to both speakers and to the interaction between them uh, so that they can do a better job. Um, we think that there should be more uniform policies on accreditation of interpreters for legal proceedings in particular and more uniformity in general. Uh, the screening tests that are done uh, by legal parties on whether they need interpreters are often uh, an area uh, you know, where there's a lot of variability. Um, people don't give suspects a language test in the second language or the, the, lang the mainstream justice language to see how well they're performing. Sometimes people can do quite well in an informal conversation but actually be very deficient in answering uh, tight, careful questions with legal implications. And so you can't just go on impressions if somebody can you know, have a, have a conversation with you and appear semi-bilingual in terms of saying, hello, how are you, or uh, in everyday matters, that doesn't mean that they're equipped uh, without an interpreter to go through something that has the legal ramifications of the, the kinds of situations that we've been describing. Um, and yet, you know, there's very little guidance as to, other than subjective statements, I need an interpreter. People, people may feel pressure not to request one. Um, and I think uh, protocols in legal proceedings to establish fairness for all need to be much more rigorous and well-defined and articulated. Uh, and as I've highlighted, there needs to be something provided about rapport and maintenance for interpreters in these settings. So that's uh, where I've ended up. I've listed here some of uh, the publications that I have referred to today. I'm happy to provide copies of those uh, to anyone uh, who's interested, and I'm willing to take questions uh, if any of you have any questions at this stage. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you don't have questions right now, feel free to approach me or contact me via email. Um, and I'll be happy to send you copies of these uh, and uh, answer any questions that might have interested you. And I'm certainly, certainly also going to add that I think there's much room for collaboration on these topics. Um, you know, there's always room for other languages to be tested. <laughs> uh, I always have far more data than we seem to have time to get through and analyze before the grant funding runs out. <laughs> um, and so there, there are data sets that we'd be happy to share. Uh, we're interested in having people uh, do coding for us as well as work on designs um, and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think uh, that I'm quite at the end of my interpreting uh, research <laughs> with cognitive psychology yet. <laughs> Or comments? Right. And thank you very much, Professor. My pleasure. <laughs>